Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, my name is Mudassar Ahmed. I'm principal with Mitra Corporation. Um, my main interest is 5G, cloud, and cybersecurity. I've been involved with the uh, Linux Foundation for a couple of years now. Um, I joined ONAP SecCom, looking at the CICD security for software assurance, and also looking at how we can use ONAP for security automation. Well, that kind of introduced me to a couple other projects. Um, I started working with uh, Elephant Tech and um, got engaged with uh, 5G Super Blueprint. So today's talk is really how can we accelerate 5G innovation, um, how Super Blueprint can help uh, the community, the ecosystem, to get ahead in an evolving marketplace. Um, my background prior to coming to MITRE was truly in networking and cloud um, applications. I worked with a major vendor in uh, networking technologies for 18 years, and some of the folks have been mentioning how they contributed code to open source, and sometimes they pulled out. Um, I've gone through software development, software testing. Um, I also, at some point in my life, uh, manage an incubation lab, and that was one of the interests that brought me to Super Blueprint. The work was very similar. In incubation, a bunch of engineers we used to just think, can we do that? And uh, would it solve that problem? And we had the budget, so we will put that team into a lab, let them figure it out. Would it work? Would it bring any efficiency or optimization? And can that be productized into some sort of either product or service. So I thought the Super Blueprint has that signature. That's why I joined Super Blueprint. Um, right now, the way I see you know, the networking and um, 5G itself is changing the market. Market is in uh, sort of a flux, right? It's new changes are coming. Uh, some of the companies may be already on board and they're prepared to tackle those changes, some are not. So um, 5G itself is a complex system. And I put this slide together to share, you know, what is the complexity? And if you look at the network evolution, we went from um, 3G, that's when the data was introduced. LTE provided a lot more data capabilities. And 5G is all about data, right? So uh, if you look at uh, the components of 5G, the IMS system, uh, IP multimedia subsystems, they're still the same as LTE, right? So there's not a whole lot of changes. But the changes came in where software is decoupled from the hardware. Then the software is also distributed. They also made an attempt to separate control plane from user plane. And that kind of trickled down into, when you look at 3GPP standards for RAN, radio access network, uh, or later on when ORAN Alliance tried to pull together interfaces, data standard, message exchange, all of this brings in a lot more complexity. The good part behind those complexity is that it still requires the technologies that Linux Foundation or any enterprise has been using, right? So in order to deploy, and that's kind of where I, I put this uh, graphics in the middle, is there are a lot of common layers that we're already familiar with. The complexity that comes in is that 5G brings in um, new deployment architectures, new interfaces, and if you look at from an architect or designer perspective, it's just another application r running in the cloud, virtualization, or hardware servers. But they all have to work together. So there needs to be connection between these layers. And um, for 5G system to work, you also have to have these BSS and OSS applications, right? For any system to run, you need to have observability. You need to have automation. So when I look at 5G, as Arpit early on in his keynote mentioned, 
5G is really a digitization effort of telecom industry. And to me, digitization is that you reduce the friction between service consumer and service provider. In technical terms, if you are an application, you're deploying a, a container, your infrastructure is providing the infrastructure services to the application. And if you're deploying a Kubernetes environment, maybe your network is providing the network or IP backhaul services for your different deployment enclaves. And if you just dig down, you might come to, you know, there's some vendor who provides uh, dark fiber optical transport for you. So there are so many layers where one layer is providing a service to a uh, vertical layer. And this all has to work well together. Um, services, when you think of 5G services, it's still gonna be those uh, three common services. Um, you still have to provide SMS. You still have to provide voice. But the major change is on the data side. The 3GPP introduced in release 15 onward a new deployment architecture for the code. And they also define how radio access network is gonna be distributed. But they did not go into the details how you will instantiate these, right? So it leaves it open, you could have uh, container base, you could have VM base, and you can actually put in the old box. But all of these are possibilities for an uh, uh, operator. They have to use those. They may have base stations out there where minor hardware changes can take that base station to uh, open RAN uh, software. They may have a core. And they are already uh, the operator who are using hybrid core, where you know the a system takes the LTE function and also uh, communicate with the 5G function. So these are a lot of possibility out there that create a lot of um, complexity. On the other hand, technologies we are using are not new, so we have expertise. We just have to bring it together in. Um, in a systematic way, so it's secure and resilient. So um, going back to our <laughs> talk of the day, what is 5G Super Blueprint and what it is not? Um, we talked earlier, there are so many different softwares out there uh, in LFN community, in LF community, in open source. They provide capabilities. So if I look at uh, Super Blueprint at a very high level, I like to put it into two, two buckets. You know, we have industry challenges and we have a network challenges. And going back to my previous uh, this slide uh, discussion, the network challenges are how do these different layers talk to each other? Um, if you think about the communication service, if you get an uh, order for an enterprise customer, they want their 50,000 employees to use 5G. And our uh, guest here, our host here, tell us. And they're on the hook to actually fulfill that order. You have to have some workflows and system that take that order, push it down through their back office business application to some OSS applications. And those OSS applications have to then look at the design of the network where this um, user's going to be, and then provide the core resources, provide the radio access or you know air interface resources, and then be able to route the traffic to the right destination for that. Um, so those are the network challenges. On the industry challenges, uh, one of the big thing that um, the 5G promise was IoT. Uh, IoT meaning there could be smaller devices that collect data and provide that data back to an application that can intelligently control that environment. And this graphics, you could see V2X, uh, that means vehicle to vehicle or vehicle to a controller application, which we already seen in Tesla model and a couple other EV um, they're doing some of these vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication, but it could be collaborated with the municipal use cases. For example, you're going on a beltway or a ring road where 
you want to adjust the traffic flow, you could even farm, or you could get that visibility. In factory, this could be your um, factory robots. So quality measurements could be one of the use cases. Um, Arpit earlier mentioned agriculture use cases, right? Uh, be able to deploy weather sensor, humidity sensor, water sensors, et cetera, that can optimize uh, your field management. So um, for any operator, you have to look at the use cases. Um, you have to do assessment and prioritize, do the planning, then integration and orchestration. This super blueprint um, group of technologies or capabilities kind of shows you that their capabilities are there. We just need to put them in some order where they can provide an end utility to an operator. So today I'm gonna kind of touch a few of the things why um, Super Blueprint will help uh, accelerate the innovation. And I'm gonna go over some um, time to market, cost saving, interoperability, use cases, etc. So time to market is another thing, right? Since market is developing new solutions, if you are not part of it, if it takes longer for you to deploy, uh, I'll give you an example. In maybe five, six years ago, if an operator had to increase the bandwidth, they had to buy the optical channels. They have to configure a whole bunch of routers from point A to point B. Uh, this whole work with maintenance schedules and the cost, cost could be 100,000 plus per gig for additional bandwidth, but it may also take three to four months to get it in place so you can actually use. And that goes, you know, that's just one example. Um, you could have a um, whole bunch of other complexity, for example, deploying your workloads. All of those, uh, if you can do that sooner, you may be able to offer that service to the consumer. And a lot of time building uh, a service, advertising a service to end customer and having your capability in place may have a lag. And if you can't do it, you may lose that opportunity if, if uh, a operator advertises that I'm able to offer this service starting Monday and all of a sudden calls come in, those customers are not gonna wait, right? So they, they may be able to find uh, alternate solutions. So um, 5G Super Blueprint started on bringing together um, some of these capabilities uh, to offer how you can do some use cases. Or originally, virtual switch and virtual firewall was a use case, but then we expanded, I think 2021, uh, Super Blueprint team actually offered a demonstration how we can deploy a 5G core and RAN network to offer 5G services. Um, and then last November, we demonstrated an IoT application. So we're going from network challenges towards um, industry challenges. And the industry challenge was how can we use IoT? And, and part of IoT is you have a massive sensors network that talks to an application. We were able to show a safety inspection in an industrial zone. For example, the demonstration was about uh, industrial zone requires safety equipment. And the example was, you gotta wear a hard hat. And uh, we deployed the camera. Application was able to pick. A person coming in the, um, in the zone would be able to pick whether or not the person was wearing hard hat. Um, so I think all in all, um, if you don't do things on time, you may miss the market opportunity. On the cost saving side, I took this example. I'm a bike rider, uh, so I thought I should explain what the cogs are. Um, so on the bike side, smaller cogs make the bike go faster. But in order to use that capability, you gotta have either um, low, low incline or very high fitness level. And we, in our a different organization, we have a different levels of maturity on a lot of these technologies. So it's a very relevant example. You can go slower, you can go faster, 
if you use the right gear. Um, cards on the business side has a different term. It's the cost of goods sold. So in the accounting term, every project have to have you know, its own financial house straight. And the cost of goods sold could be if I want to launch, let's say, um, a 10 gig service, what would it take? Right? So part of it would be capital expenditure. You're going to bring in software, hardware, uh, all the miscellaneous items that go with it. But you also have a development and integration cost. In a service provider network, you know, when you develop these services, you call it product engineering. They need to pull together all the package. Once deployed, it will work as intended. And whatever needs to be part of that deployment architecture, that has to be engineered together. Right? That's what TELUS was talking about, how they pull together things. So th those are the costs that will go in. Then you have operational costs. I remember when I first job back in late 90s uh, as a system administrator, we had about 1 to 12 ratio. If there were 12 servers, Netwares, Windows, and Linux, uh, uh, Solaris stuff, there was one engineer that will manage patching, maintenance, you know, all that kind of stuff. But things have changed, right? Now you can manage thousands of servers. You just need one person, provided you have a, right type of automation and tools in place. And we're going toward um, machine managing the machines. You guys here uh, in LFN and open source community are makers. You make that automation software. So last thing I'll talk about the COGS is, you know, all the COGS don't matter. If return on investment is negative with service provider, the project is not going anywhere. So in, in most cases, those will be assessed. There will be so many different um, analysis done on the financials before even project takes off. We can do that. We can lower the risk on ROI, maybe increase the uh, amount of ROI or decrease the time, right? Because if you think about it, if you buy something, in the US at least, you get five-year amortization on those hardware. You put the expense, you bought the things, and you can write it off for tax purposes for five years. After that, you can't write it off. So if your deployment takes about a year and a half, you only have three and a half years to recoup your expenses, right? So somewhere you need to accelerate those things so that the projects have a maximum benefit of uh, return on that. So another thing that uh, I usually give people examples, and I think that example fits well here, Legos example, right? So Legos are different blocks. When we were a kid, we'll pull together different colors, build something out of it. I see that uh, open source produces a lot of these Lego capabilities. But they need to come together to become something, whether you want to build uh, Star War, that's the one common set that you can buy with Legos, build a city out of it, or create a Tonka truck, whatever your favorite is. But in our case, I think we need to pull together these different capabilities, Lego blocks, so we can offer a value-added service to our end user. In those cases, it would be enterprise customers, it could be service provider customers, right? In LFN, we have a whole bunch of projects. If you take the umbrella, uh, Linux Foundation itself, it covers cloud, it covers networking, it covers a lot of endpoint it, um, utilities. So diversity is important because if you are not dipping into open source, you may be facing intellectual incest, right? You have a very close environment, limited number of options, your own company, your own um, center of excellence is limited to those ideas. When bringing it to um, LFN projects like Super Blueprint, you get a different perspective. And those perspectives may bring an option that's more optimized, less expensive. Um, same thing with scale. You know, you may be able, your product or your project may be limited currently. When you bring it to Super Blueprint, that project may have wider uh, integration scale. 
And you can also discover interoperability. For service provider, these things are important, right? They always want best of the breed. In the past, if, if you've noticed, for every capability, you will have minimum two to three vendors because they need to make sure that business survives if a vendor files bankruptcy or liquidate. So they cannot go with the best of the breed. They will always have two, three. I think that's the same thing. If I'm trying to solve a problem within, uh, let's say, Super Blueprint, uh, we earlier touched a little bit on Nephew and ONAP and a couple other automation and orchestration tools. I think they can all coexist because they, they may provide that um, hedge against if project goes uh, into archive mode, right? Um, another part of interoperability is the 5G is not net new, right? Most people, except for the enterprise, uh, which, will, which will do a greenfield deployment, like large enterprises who will be putting their own networks, but for major operator, this is not new, right? It has to inter interoperate with their existing system their LTE system, their VSS system, OSS system. So interoperability is another way to look at does your product, your project, or your capability interoperates. So a little bit of background um, on the use cases. Um, we, in 20, uh, early on for 2023 planning, um, we looked into what can we do uh, this year under Super Blueprint. Um, and a couple of uh, philosophical um, decisions there. Does it have to be open source? We know the reality that for a service provider or a user, it's a mix, right? They will have vendor solution. They will have open source solution. So we are open, uh, at least in the community, that both have the, both open source and vendor supported solutions have to coexist. So based on that, we're looking at, we got a lot of capabilities within uh, Linux Foundation. We want to bring them in to uh, solve some of the network challenges. Once we build a, uh, a baseline 5G system, then we can use industry challenges and provide solutions for industry challenges like we did for IoT uh, last November. So we invited um, uh, a couple of uh, new companies that joined uh, Linux Foundation to see what kind of use cases we can come up with. So one of the use cases that we have right now is uh, workload placement on mobile edge compute. And that's a real need. Um, to 3GPP standards allow you to distribute certain radio access network like uh, CU, DU, uh, and the RIC, right? So there's a um, non-real-time RIC and real-time RIC. And real-time RIC has some latency requirement because it provides a lot of optimization, machine learning, and correction and mitigation for the radio access uh, elements like CU, DU, and uh, RU. So, we think that uh, that kind of uh, need will demand that there is some way to figure out how to deploy certain workloads in certain locations. How can we do that? So uh, the first use case, uh, um, uh, Mac placement, uh, we, we are pairing with uh, Equinix. It's a cloud data center edge, edge compute provider. They have some tools. We're going to bring those tools with the 5G deployment tools that we have in our super blueprint. Another use case that we are considering is remote attestation uh, for IoT devices for security and authentication. So a little bit of context on IoT device um, compared to PCs, smartphones, or servers, we expect the IoT devices will have very skinny operating system. Um, IoT devices, in some cases, may be uh, just a, um, a small device that sends beacon, and a beacon is coded for uh, binary bit decisions. Is there a moisture or not? So it will send a very small message, 
that needs to go back to the IoT application. So it may not have a lot of capability like a full-fledged operating system that can offer where you can put something. So this particular use case, uh, we have a new open source uh, uh, project from Paratone Labs. They wrote uh, a software called Sediment. So Sediment is uh, um, a validator verifier engine and a small code that goes, goes on the IoT device. So when IoT device boots up, it's going to send its passport or its um, credentials. And if the credentials are verified, that IoT device becomes part of the, the IoT application. So that will give you security on when you're deploying mass number of sensors, um, you're deploying cameras, or any other IoT devices within, um, within a particular um, industry use case. Uh, reason why it's important, because as we increase IP endpoints, these all IP endpoints can be jumping board for somebody who has nefarious intents. And these IoT devices will not be able to use access lists and things like that, right? So it's important to know who you're collecting data from, who's part of your network. Um, second part is um, IoT devices onboarding and maintenance. So if IoT devices uh, can provide you a point in time information about their security uh, and their credentials, what happens when you change? Because if your config changes, your software level changes, that may change your own um, uh, persona or your own capability. So those have to be accounted for. And finally, we're looking at changing the super blueprint to provide network as a service. And as we've seen, there are multiple layers. Uh, 5G is an application, provides uh, communication services for data transport, voice, and SMS. But then it consumes resources underneath. Um, so we, we're taking that approach, network as a service. Um, there's two parts to it. Uh, one for sure, we're going to do network as a service and try to create demonstration and provide uh, some um, recommendation on that. The other part is, can this be a self-service portal? Can these services offer a portal or an API where you can connect these layers together? And I think. ONAP has some capability because you can do um, design, orchestration, and deployment. Uh, Nephew has some capabilities, but you have to offer some sort of playbook. Um, Super Blueprint does not write codes, right? It is an integration effort to show this can be done, then document that. So if somebody else has to do it, they don't have to spend days and days trying to figure out how do I get the network up or that particular domain up. So our intent is that every um, program increment cycle will offer a service. That service will include documentation, URL to those libraries or repositories. So if somebody else has to do it, they can do it in shorter time because we figure out how to do it with all the mistakes that were made. They've been taken care of, and now you have a correct procedure. Um, I think that will accelerate, because there are a lot of people who want to do uh, different services based on 5G network. But if you go buy a 5G network from Ericsson, Nokia, Huawei, any of those, it's a huge expense. So think of this, if these playbooks or these software packages can provide you a lab in the box, the, op, uh, the people who are researching new uh, capabilities, they can easily do it. Or even if you are writing some um, optimization code, you could do that easily because the rest of the uh, environment is available for you to experiment with. And that will come in handy because part of that, uh, these use cases, um, we have done a, s a slicing demonstration previously, but well, we expect that in the future, your slice needs to carry your security SLAs. And that way, you can deploy 
secure communication, resilient communication as part of the same workflow that you're using for your instantiation of particular network function. So this one, I think all of, all of, all of these points have been previously discussed, I think, between success and failure is going to be, can you take your project or capability and introduce it to the wider audience? And can you provide usability in terms of how to make it happen? I think uh, a lot of these projects, like um, we're looking at ODL, not to put you on point, Robert, but we have to take the capability and present it in a way where it's easily usable, right? And that part we can gain through here where different projects can come in, uh, whether you are doing a networking as a function, where you are virtualizing a particular communication layer, or you're adding automation for observability or mitigation loops. All of these, you know, a lot of these capabilities are there. We just need to show how this can be done so people can start using it. Because bringing, you know, when I looked at that slide that Arpe put it in, there's so many projects, right? Where do I start? That information is now there. With the Super Blueprint, our intent is that for use cases, if you want to do industrial IoT, here is the playbook. You take all these software, deploy it, and then you tweak, right? It's a learning process. I don't think anything is perfect right now. But um, between success and failure, if you don't have learning, we can't cross that bridge. So we need to get these things out, and that's beneficial for different projects. They already have the capabilities, just not touching the uh, maybe right issues or challenges, but bringing those into Super Blueprint to demonstrate how a particular challenge can be solved and solutions can be provided. I think those learning can improve the success rate and accelerate the innovation. Um, in the past year, uh, year or two, uh, we had a couple of companies like Clum. Clum is um, ORAM compliant uh, UPF and firewalling company. They brought in and we integrated that into our solution. Uh, GenXCom GXC software was used as a distributed base station for 5G antennas. So we used their um, CU and DU in our um, solution. IBM provided IoT uh, application servers. That's what we use to demonstrate that you could do uh, industry inspection. And you know, once you have that blueprint, you could use it for anything. I think we can repeat that for agriculture or any other municipal. For example, if you have a few sensors out in the city, and in the wintertime you want to know the snow or humidity, I think you can get that information easily. Um, Wave Labs, uh, Periton, sorry. The Periton is bringing us the attestation. So right now, we're focused on IoT because that part hasn't been touched. Servers and PCs have endpoint protection, right? So there's some way to attest server and PC, but IoT devices have, hasn't been touched. So that was the focus for the group. We, we're using that uh, in a coming demonstration. Um, WaveLab is helping. Arna Network help orchestrate and deploy 5G in 2021, and they're still active uh, with us. Equinox is providing um, Mexport, uh, how to deploy workloads on edge compute. And Equinox is another company that uh, open source a software called CubeArmor. And the CubeArmor is a security software for Kubernetes systems that can expand to other um, it provides you visibility to communication between functions on the network. So it's kind of based on uh, eBPF, but they created policy server, policy um, implementation point. So if you build a slice in 5G, you deploy the network, you can actually deploy the security policy, which network function can talk to each other and what port and it will monitor and control. So um, I think uh, what we're looking for um, is key use cases 
for secure deployment for slicing, edge compute, service creation, deployment automation, and we heard today a lot of these capabilities are already in Elephant portfolio. So this is where I try to reach out to projects and the companies who are in this business either as a user because we could share ideas, right? identify needs. And then um, if you have resources, you can bring your software for different projects or a company who wants to integrate with uh, 5G Super Blueprint, they can bring their software, they can bring their expertise, or just bring your leadership, right? How we can get this, you know, next use case, next increment uh, set up. Um, I have some information here, uh, Super Blueprint at LFN, lfnetworking.org, and then there is a URL underneath on the slides that will be shared with you. You can click on it. We have a huge backlog because we've been collecting the uh, use cases that we intend to undertake in the future. Your support will be very helpful. How are we looking at the time? All right. Any questions? Uh, my question was, uh, would you maintain the blueprint even after releases? Let's say that you released a couple of blueprints earlier with Arnad, you, Amcop, and you orchestrated a cloud to edge to cloud connectivity, right, in one of the blueprints. Mm -hmm. So as time goes on, every component has migrated to the higher level versions, right? If I want, somebody wants to have released all these blueprints, if I want to go and try that blueprint, now the components are already at a higher level, if I start doing the blueprint, I have to either go to the lower level because they won't support those versions anymore. So is it kind of you'll try to make sure that all the blueprints are up to date? How yeah, so, so blueprint is slightly different from software release, right? So we don't produce code. No, I understand. Right? When you say so, blueprint, right? You, you, my understanding of blueprint is you are trying to connect all these different softwares together to solve a use case. Right. So you are showing that proof of concept, mm -hmm. right? So let's say from here from now, I want to try that proof of concept in my lab, as you said, right? I'm just saying I want to try it out. But all the software you talked about has already moved a few versions up. They all bummed up, right? So I cannot go back to that older blueprint and then go try it out because the dependencies are not met. If I try to pull the software for that, it's all changed, the API changes. So it might not work as specified by the blueprint documentation, right? Um, so there's a remote possibility that might happen but because we're looking at the capabilities, not a strict APIs, for example, we use IBM, right? Next time we don't have to use IBM if there's another software available, we can use it. What you get from Super Blueprint demonstration and outcome is set of instruction, a write-up, a white paper. We do demonstration, right? It's a POC demonstration, this is how it works. What we're trying to capture in that uh, white paper is, uh, what did we use? sort of software bill of material, hardware bill of material, what are the key configurations, right? When we use GXC with open um, 5G core, we capture the configuration on GXC. How uh, a CU is configured to connect to a free 5GC AMF, which is to us, which is the important fact, right? So tomorrow you can use um, UE RAN SIM you can still use the same configuration. So we're, the way we're trying to do is to get you going by reading the white paper or looking at the outcome of our um, demonstration to get you started so that you don't spend two months, three months bringing up the environment. Yeah, I definitely agree. You know, that is going to be still helpful. Uh, there's no doubt about it, right, when we try to bring up something. I was just worried about you were talking about the configuration and then it goes to upper level, then it's all changes. So then it's... That's, yeah, where, that's, that's where the problem is. So I was trying to understand whether when yeah. you have a blueprint, whether every release, maybe you have a small cycle to up the version numbers and then publish it, any changes to it, right? Yeah, so that, that will that. happen too, uh, because we do upgrade to the latest greatest when a new version comes up. But in this sort of mix, 
we have, so the key components we have is code and RAN, right? That makes up the 5G. Then somebody comes along, like Kalum came along and said, we want to offer you UPF. So instead of using free 5GC UPF, you take that element out, don't configure it, you use Kalum UPF. That's one thing that the 5G offer is, you can plug and play any of those functions. Like your UDM can come from Oracle, right? Or it could be an open source or your uh, AMF, SMF, and UPF could come from Magma, which was do another project donated uh, by uh, Facebook, right? So we have the ability to do this plug and play. So we're not actually following the software versioning aspect. We're just giving you the playbook that if you want to get started, here's the software bill of material. This is the kind of hardware we use. This is the configuration we use that will get you to a working solution, and then you sort of learn and f provide feedback. Maybe next iteration we can use uh, your ideas, right? Yeah, I wanted to point out that Super, Super Blueprint doesn't have a downloadable and runnable deliver deliverable. It's mostly a documentation a project which brings up the ideas. Um, and when, when you say, um, a playbook. It's not an Ansible playbook. No. <laughs> it's, 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 it's a playbook for humans to interpret and, and um, essentially tailor to their requirements, which brings it together. Uh, that having been said, on um, the participating projects, which are actually software projects, um, those bits and pieces that get used in, in super, super Blueprint end up being software deliverables for those projects. So they tend to have CSIT, con uh, readily deployable containers that you can just download. It's just that we are not going to give you an Ansible playbook that if you point it to Kubernetes and I'm making things up, it will bring up a fully functional 5G core for you. No, you, you have to do those integrations still yourself or hire an integrator who will do that for you. I apologize, in American football, all coaches have a playbook. That's how they want to run the game, if all goes well. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, I appreciate your time and your attention, and I hope to see your voices in our uh, calls, uh, bring capabilities, and you don't have to uh, contribute on long term, right? That's why I you know, I mentioned that software expertise and leadership, sometimes it's just an idea, you know. The biggest part is finding the problems that exist that most people can say, yep, that's a true problem. We don't want to spend our resources on a problem that nobody cares about, right? So we need to sort of prioritize, find a problem that exists out there. We thought uh, edge compute deployment is a big thing. Um, we don't see a lot of solutions out there who can clearly be open source and be able to uh, provide the same utility. So any other challenges, you can shoot an email that, hey, what about trying to do this use case, one to two lines describing the problem, uh, and you don't have to spend a lot of resources. And if you're more interested, uh, you know, other skills can be used too, right? You can bring your uh, programming skills to automate some deployments. That's fair game. Well, thank you very much. Uh, so, 